Good morning. It's great to be sharing with you today. I'm going to be honest, we're between preaching series this morning. We sort of concluded, oh, Jesus is alive, now what mini thing that we had going on. And next week, and I feel like I'm, I'm a little bit mean to him sometimes, so I'm going to pick him up a bit. The wonderful, the brilliant, the very handsome Matt Ashworth is going to be uh, kicking off our new preaching series. It's going to... It was true, I meant it. Um, it's gonna, he's going to be preaching, on, uh, kicking off our next preaching series. We're, we're going into the book of Daniel. We're going to be there till the end of July. I feel like it's been a little while since we just set up camp in one book and went through it. So I'm really looking forward to that. I know Matt's got some real life that he wants to bring to us through that as well. Um, but as a result, I've kind of got free reign on, on what we're going to talk about today. So I'm just going to be honest with you. I'm just going to spend some time talking about something that I think is beautiful about Jesus and I think is good news for us today. Does that sound okay? Simple as that? Yeah. Yeah, 50%. Half interested. Yeah. yeah. I think it's good news. I think it's something that's worth talking about. I've not got a fancy intro. We're jumping straight into the Bible. We're in Luke chapter 7, if that's okay. It's going to come up on the screen. Boom. Luke chapter 7, verse 36 to 50. And it says this. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and he reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eaten at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. And then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them and poured perfume on them. And when the Pharisee who had invited them saw this, he said to himself, oh, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered them, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed them 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both of them. Now, which one of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. And then he turned towards the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman, from the time I entered, has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you that her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever is forgiven little, loves little. And Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. And the other guests began to say amongst themselves, who is this who even can forgive sins? Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. The thing I want to talk about today, it's really simple. Many of us will will have heard it before, but it's simply this. People look at the outward appearance. The Lord looks at the heart. That's something that I think is beautiful about Jesus. It's a quote, this isn't my own clever title, just in case you spotted it from somewhere. It's from 1 Samuel 16 in in the Old Testament when God promises that he will give the people of Israel a king. And he says, this king is going to be the son of a man called Jesse. And Jesse has eight sons, so he gets them all out on like a bit of a fashion catwalk sort of thing going on. And Samuel goes to check out the sons and figure out which one is going to be the new king. And Jesse brings out, clearly, the son that he's most impressed in. The one that he's obviously most proud of. His name is Eliab. And we know that he must have been a little bit like Matt. There you go. That's how genuine it is. He must have been a strong, tall, handsome bloke because Samuel's reply to seeing him is, whoa, look at this dude. Like clearly the Lord's anointed stands before the Lord right now. Look at him. He's a beefcake. He just thought, it's just, he's great. Clearly this must, it must be the one who's going to be the king of Israel. But God answers and surprises Samuel. He says this, do not consider his appearance or his height. So he was at all good looker. For I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things that people look at. Thank goodness. The Lord looks at the heart. 
And in Luke, we see that this is a a characteristic of God in the story that we've just read that actually is absolutely at the core of who he is. It's not just like an Old Testament thing that God used to be like. This is part of God's character. This is a theme that runs all throughout the word. It's part of his never changing nature. In the, in the passages that we've read today, Jesus is faced with two very contrasting characters. I, I believe they're deliberately contrasting. I think this is intentional so that we would get the point that he is trying to make to us today. First, we're, we're introduced to a man. He's a Pharisee. His name is Simon. And actually, as a Pharisee, he will have been a man who was worthy of some respect in the community. He will have held a position of of esteem. People will have looked to him for guidance. Actually, to be invited to his house for dinner would have been a real honor. Like, you would have been on your best behavior. I would not have been invited to this man's house because I would have embarrassed myself and made a state of what was going on. It would have been an honor. You'd be thinking, wow, I better better show up. I better dress. I better dress well. I better behave well because this is a man who, who teaches people how to live in accordance with God's will. He will have been a leader in the local synagogue. He will have stood on a public platform teaching and instructing people, most likely. But we see that Jesus is just not remotely impressed by any of this. He's not phased by any of these cultural, societal, societal, sorry, societal things that we tend to be impressed by. Because people look at the outward appearance of the Lord looks at the heart it's a simple point today i'm sorry you're going to hear it a few times get used to it you can say it with me if you want that's absolutely fine i don't mind jesus is clear in the gospels that actually many of the pharisees and many of the teachers of law they were just hypocrites they they were people who stood at the front and put heavy burdens of, of, of um of shame of guilt on people of piety who said you must live your life in this exact way or I will be judging you and so will everyone around you but then these same men behind closed doors did not live a life that matched up (laughs) to the things that they were teaching they were hypocritical people and we're not told that specifically about Simon but we do see a specific glimpse into his heart he says to himself oh and you can almost hear the disgust oh if this man were a prophet he would know the type of woman who is touching him. She is a sinner. We, we see a glimpse into this ugliness of his heart. Simon has clearly invited Jesus into his house, already cynical, already ready to judge Jesus and write him off and say that he is not who he says he is. And actually his pride in his own position, in his own status in the community, it comes out as disgust when he witnesses this woman fall down and worship Jesus in the most incredible, beautiful way. His response is disgust. We see who this man is. We get his heart. And Jesus is swift. He's quick. He rebukes Simon. He uses a parable just to very, very briefly illustrate the idea of forgiveness and its importance. And then actually, he turns the tables on Simon. This man who is totally satisfied in his own piety, in his own position, in in his own status, effectively Jesus holds up a mirror to his heart and says, look at you. Look at Look at who you really are. He shows him all this stuff that he defines himself by, all this stuff that Simon believes to be of such great worth, and it's just outward appearance. That's all it is. The second character that we're we're introduced to is, of course, the woman. The woman whose name we are not even told. We don't get a name for this woman. And I want to be really clear this morning, I don't believe that's the failing of an old book that didn't like naming women, and it named the men instead. I don't think that's the case. I think we see all over the Bible specific individual women who are named and honoured and elevated and used by God in incredible ways, often to shame the men around them who weren't doing the stuff they were meant to be doing. The Bible is perfectly capable of honouring women. That's not what's going on here. I think we are intentionally not given her name so that we would know her by one thing and one thing only, how she is first introduced to us. She was a sinful woman. The Bible's trying to be really clear. Make no mistakes, this woman was getting it wrong. 
This woman will have been known in her community by her behavior, by her actions that were just publicly, demonstrably counter to what you would hope someone who wanted to follow God would do. She will have been labeled as a sinful woman. Her name didn't matter to the community around her. In fact, she herself probably labeled herself as such. When she looked in the mirror, all she saw was, saw, all she saw was a woman whose life was full of sin. She will have been acting in ways that actually at the time, culturally, if you know a bit about Jewish history in the Bible, she will have been ceremonially unclean. We won't get into all the details of what that means today, but if she touched someone else, actually they'd have to wash and do all this stuff. It's very, very complicated. Actually, she was someone who will have been outcast from the Jewish society as a result of her evidenceable behavior. I want to be really clear. There's no misunderstanding here. People knew who she was. She was known. And yet again, just like with the Pharisee, we see Jesus is not remotely phased by any of this. Why? Because people look at the outward appearance, but the Lord, thank you so much, I really appreciate that, but the Lord looks at the heart. Immediately we see the contrast that are drawn between Simon and this woman. Simon hears that Jesus is nearby, and so he quite cynically invites Jesus in, clearly trying to catch him out. Trying to, trying to disprove that any of the claims that Jesus makes about who he is, is true. The woman hears that Jesus is nearby, and so immediately she grabs what will have been one of the most, if not the most expensive things she could possibly get her hands on, an alabaster jar full of perfume. Full of alabaster jar full of perfume. Pull of perfume, yeah, thank you. Um, an alabaster jar full of perfume, and she immediately makes her way towards Jesus. She approaches him. She travels to where he is. We see that Simon is unfazed to the presence by the presence of Jesus to the point that he doesn't even extend some of the basic hospitalities you would give to a guest who arrived at your home during that time. He doesn't even bother. He's just not fussed about who this Jesus bloke even is. And yet the woman arrives and she stands behind him. She doesn't even dare look him in the face. She just weeps in the presence of the one that she has approached. When Simon gave Jesus no water with which to wash his feet, the woman's tears fell and she started to mop his feet with her hair. When Simon gave Jesus no oil to anoint his head to demonstrate that he was a welcome guest, the woman continuously poured out all that she had in this alabaster jar of perfume at the feet of Jesus. When Simon did not eat even greet Jesus with a kiss throughout the whole encounter the woman cannot stop kissing Jesus's feet it is an act of worship <laughs> and as a result Jesus blesses one of these two individuals he has an individual there who is presenting in all the right ways in society all the right ways on the outside and he has an individual there who's presenting in all the wrong ways doing all of the wrong stuff and he blesses the second one. He says to the woman, your sins are forgiven. Publicly, in front of everyone, he turns their attention to her and says, your sins are forgiven. And the people, the other guests in the house are like, what the flip is going on? Who is this guy who says that he can forgive sins? And again, Jesus isn't intimidated. He's not impressed. He's not worried by whispers and rumors. He doubles down on what he has said and says, your faith has set you free. So go in peace. Go in peace. Why do I think this is good news for all of us today? I think it's good news for two reasons. Um, the first one is really simply this. We've heard a little bit about this already, I believe. It's come out in some of the words this morning. First one's really simple. We can always approach him. I should have underlined the always. We can always approach him. There will be times in our lives where we end up as outsiders. We end up sort of on the outskirts of friendship groups or, you know, co-worker relations because of things that are outside of our control. 
Times when maybe people misunderstand what we meant or actually times when people deliberately, maliciously speak about us behind our backs and, and do things and act towards us in a way that means we end up feeling a bit, a bit like this woman, a bit on the outside of, of society. And of course, Jesus is desperate that we would draw near to him in those times that we would know his comfort and his peace and his love and his shelter. But I think what is perhaps more important for the church to continually keep saying again, again and again and again is it's not just about the times when we have been misunderstood it's about the times when we messed up it's about the times when we are in the position we are in and it is entirely our fault we still approach him we need to it's what we must do we need to be really clear this woman I've labored this point a bit already I'm going to do it again she was not mislabeled she was not misunderstood. There was no campaign to try and like, ruin her identity in the eyes of other, other people. That's not what was going on. She was living in a way that was wrong. It was offensive to God. That's what sin is. When we hear God's will for our lives and we do the opposite instead, when we hear that there is an all-loving, all-powerful, all-knowing creator of the universe who is desperate to speak into our lives and say, go this way, do this thing, and we say, oh, I'd rather not. I'd rather do this other thing instead. We need to be really clear. It's not a misunderstanding. You know, sometimes we, we fall into temptation. We, we find ourselves in situations where, actually, if we're really honest and like hand on heart, if we planned it in advance, we wouldn't have done the thing that we ended up doing. We wouldn't have, like genuinely, we would not have made that mistake and planned to do it in advance, but we just end up in a situation where the circumstances are just right and the temptation is too great and our vulnerability and our weakness comes out and we fall into these situations where we do things that we just know are not right. You know, we, we frequently hear throughout the words, protect yourself from these situations, take every step to avoid these situations, but we are human beings and we fail and we frequently fall short. I think sometimes, if we're really honest, we plan in advance to sin. I think we need to be really, really honest about that. We need to examine our own hearts and say, do you know what, sometimes I plan in advance to go against what I know God wants me to do. Sometimes it's subtle. Sometimes it's by allowing myself to enter into a situation where I know that temptation will be there. That's planning in advance. We need to be radical people. We need to be those who say, where does sin start? It starts way earlier than we are willing to admit, admit far often than not. We plan it in advance. Sometimes it's not that subtle. We just hear what God says and go, nah, nah I don't fancy that. I want to do the thing that feels nice instead. Whatever the case may be, sometimes we plan in advance to sin. And we're told, again, in the word, in the word to take every step to stop that from happening, to, to not enter into those situations. But again, we are human beings and we frequently fail and we frequently fall short. Sure. I believe really strongly that's why the woman is labelled so starkly in today's story. There's no alternate explanation about who she is. A sinful woman. It, it, it's stark on purpose for us today because it's not just about those times when we've been caught out and there's been a misunderstanding it's not just about the times when we feel hurt and outcast through no fault of our own the story is here so that we could know we can always approach him always if we are able to lay down our pride if we're if we're able just just for a moment just for a second to put to side all that stuff, all the, all the sin, all the, all the shame, all the guilt that we've, we've heard about this morning that the enemy would try and use to label us and tell us that we are not free. If we're able just for a moment just to put it to one side and instead, like the woman did, hear who Jesus is, hear that he is nearby and as a result intentionally approach Jesus, not in spite of our sin, but because of our sin because we know that he is the one who gives forgiveness and gives freedom actually if we can manage to do that then his response is an absolute guarantee we don't need to be worried about how he will respond to us when we come to him in those circumstances he will never turn away anyone whose heart is to come and fall at his feet 
Never. It does not matter what we have done. It does not matter if all of society would correctly label us as sinful and bad. If we come to him because we have heard about who he is and heard that he and he alone offers forgiveness and salvation, then he will never turn us away. We might be afraid. We might just stand behind him at first, not daring to to look into his face. It might be costly. There might be stuff that we need to bring, pick up on the way, like the woman's alabaster jar of perfume, and just, just pour it at his feet. There might be tears. We might not feel like we're able to look him in the eye, and instead we just bow down and kiss him feet, his feet. But we can have confidence that when we approach Jesus, fully aware of our sin and of our brokenness, his response will always be beautiful and full of love. Church, I want to be really honest. Many of you will have, you will have heard this message before. I want to continue being honest. Many of you are really bad at it. So, so am I. That's what I'm convicted of today. I think this really matters. We say, yeah, I know this. No, we don't. We don't live in a way that shows we know we are this free. We don't live in a way that shows we know that we can always approach him like we've heard about this morning. We let the lies get to us. Instead, we say, yeah, I've heard that before. Yeah, but when did you last do it? When did you last say, Jesus, I am fully aware of my sin and my brokenness. And as a result, I am coming to you because you offer forgiveness and freedom and salvation. I am not going to let that draw me in the other direction. I'm not going to let that send me down another path. I'm not going to waste a single second of my time here on this earth when you are saying, come to me and no freedom. Okay, that is what I will do. I'm sorry, Lord. I, th- I think we need, to get, we need to get better at that. I, I have the absolute pleasure in this church of being involved with our youth and, and doing youth groups at various points and parents in the room. I'm just going to be really honest with you. I unapologetically, and you can disagree with me at the end, please do, let's have a discussion, but I unapologetically tell, tell our kids, if you only learn this in your time with us, great. If, that, if that's it, if that's all you ever hear me say, praise the Lord. Like if, if that really goes in deep into your heart and your character and who you are, then thank God I have done my job and I can rest at night. If you get this, yeah, of course, live in a way that is wise. Yeah, of course, follow biblical instruction and what, you, what your parents say. Of course, strive for all of this stuff. But above everything else, would you please know that there is nothing we can do There is nowhere we can run. There is no one that we can become that actually can separate us from the love of God. We can always approach him and know his forgiveness. I know we've heard it before, but church, I think if we're armed with this, like really, not head knowledge, I think if we get this, we see God do amazing stuff. And I mean amazing stuff like in our, in our lives, in our families, in our cities, in our nation. I think if the church globally fully gets this, what can hold us back? Because whom the sun sets free we, is free. Indeed, we need to get this this morning. And I'm willing to bet that most of you, myself included, need to hear it again. We can always approach him. And I would just say as well, it's allowed to be messy there's a bit of comedy in, in the woman approaching. Like she wasn't invited. She just rocked up at some bloke's house with a jar of perfume and starts crying. Like it's weird, man. Like she doesn't introduce herself. She walks in and stands. I imagine you're having dinner with someone and someone walks in, stands behind the person that you're talking to, starts crying. It's the tears go on the feet and then she wipes the feet with the hair and pours perfume. It's odd. It's weird. It's allowed to be messy. The point is, man looks at the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. We can always come to him. Second one. I'll make sure this is quicker for you, okay? I promise this is quicker. It's the other side of the coin. It's kind of the reverse of what we've already been talking about. I've had a little bit of a busy week, and I'm sorry if, as a result, I've phrased this more bluntly than I would normally, but he just doesn't have time for our Pharisee nonsense. He just doesn't. He's just not interested. He just does not have... Time for it. Simon and so many other Pharisees that we read about in the Bible are so self-assured of their status with God. They're so confident of who they are before the Lord. And the problem is that the foundation they would point to is a false one. 
The foundation that they would point to is not the truth, it's not the way, it's not the life, it's other things that are not going to make sure that one day you will stand before the Father. I think we find ourselves in this position perhaps far more quickly than we are willing to admit a lot of the time. Can I make a few statements? The slightly cartoony statements, you might need to nuance them a little bit for yourself. But if you relate to any of them, I would argue we've got some Pharisee nonsense going on and we need to let Jesus deal with it today. First one is this. I read my Bible every day this week. I'm a good Christian. Okay. I prayed out loud in life group on Wednesday evening. Of course, I can bring a word today. Okay. I've served on a rotor for eight weeks in a row. God's definitely proud of me. I would never find myself in the situation that person has. I grew out of it long ago. And perhaps more honestly than I should be with you this morning, but I hope it helps you to see the heart from which I'm bringing this today. I'm an elder in the church. Of course, my standing with God is good. Really? Is that how that works? Is that what the Bible says? It's about your position, Phil. You're an elder, so... Don't need to put any effort into the relationship. It's not what it says. It's not what it says. I'll be honest. It's a bit of Pharisee in my heart. If I'm not careful, if I don't have brothers around me to say, Phil, how are you really doing with God? I'd slip into that. I would. Most of you would as well. There's no shame in it. It's who we are. <laughs> We're human beings. Do you know that there are many differences between Simon and the woman that we've read about in Luke. We could do a big list. It'd be quite funny, I'm sure, looking at all kinds of things. But actually, there's only one difference that really matters. One of those two people was pursuing Jesus, and one of them was not. That's it. That's the difference that the word would highlight to us today, church. Can we not be found on the wrong side of that seesaw? If it's a binary choice between being those who are pursuing Jesus, no matter how messy it looks, or actually very tidy on the outside, but not really pursuing him, can I beg you, can we be found on the right side of that seesaw? Can we be a messy bunch of fools who are pursuing Jesus with all that we are? Please, can that be who we are? I think that really matters today. Jesus makes this really plain. These are verses that terrify me to this day. I read these early on as a Christian, and... We must read these as though it could be us. Jesus is not speaking to those people over there. This is a warning to all of us today. He says this, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. This is the bit that must apply to us. It has to. We need to read it as a warning. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not drive out demons in your name and perform many miracles? Was I not an elder of your church? Did I not serve on the kids team for 15 years without ever missing a Sunday? Did I not do all of this stuff? And he will turn to us and say, get away from me. I do not even know you. That's terrifying. I find it terrifying. Anyway, that's, that's a potential reality, is that we could get so caught up with the stuff that we would miss him. He knows that is a temptation of our heart, and he says, do not do it, please. Don't be like one of the Pharisees. There's so many things that we can be tempted to build our faith upon. There's so many things we can be tempted to build our relationship with him on, but there is only one that leads to salvation and his name is Jesus. He says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I am not impressed by your religious credentials. Your CV is of no consequence. It's about me it's about you and me he doesn't look at the things that are available for other people to look at he looks exclusively and entirely at our hearts that's what matters to him the good news for us today is that Jesus is able and willing desperate I would go as far as to say as to break these lies off of us It's something that he longs to do. He longs to come and bring freedom. Actually, where there's pride that I've let creep in a little bit further than I should have. Or whether actually my relationship with him has just become about what I do rather than who he is and pursuing him as king and master and friend. The good news is that I think in love, Jesus would love to break some of us down today. And I, I use that terminology very deliberately. I'm reminded of like a Lego building. 
Like I think for some of us, he needs to take all the pieces apart. They, they might even be good pieces. There might be really good stuff in there. And he wants to break it down because the structure's just going awry. It's just going in a weird direction, man. And he's saying, no, 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 <laughs> that wasn't the plan. Let me break it down again. And we go again. We start again. It's all about you and me. I'm just reminded of this hymn. It says, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and his grace. I'm sorry if I've been a bit blunter than perhaps normal this morning. I hope you hear my heart in it. I hope you hear the love in it. I hope you hear the the freedom that is on offer. I would suggest there's two places that we need to respond from this morning. Maybe we relate to the sinful woman. Maybe we relate to the Pharisee. The response is the same. We come to him. We pursue him. Say, Jesus, if I'm Pharisee and about, break it off me. Break it off me, Lord. I am willing to lose everything if I keep you. All of my status, all of my stuff, I want you and you alone, exclusively you. Would you make that true in my heart this morning? If you're in that place where you relate to the sinful woman and you think everyone knows this thing about me or maybe only you know this thing that's been going on but it feels far too big, it stops you from coming to him. His heart is that you would approach him this morning and it might be messy, it might not be, but it might be messy. That is okay. That is okay. Remember the woman crying, hair, tears, oil. It's messy. It just is. That is okay. Just to be really honest with you, I I hope that we strive to facilitate response in a number of ways. I I hope there's a number of ways that you can can engage with Jesus when you come to church. I just feel convicted this morning that for some of us, it, it just requires stepping out of our comfort zone. That was not a comfortable thing for the woman to arrive at a house uninvited and just weep. But she went for one reason and one reason alone. She heard that Jesus was there. She heard that Jesus was there. I think for some of us, he would say, the stuff you have been carrying for years, and today's the day. Today's the day it gets broken off. Today's the day it gets left behind. But guess what? You're going to have to step out. You're going to have to approach me. It might feel vulnerable. It's okay. You are coming because I am here. You're not coming because your friend invited you. You're not coming because you've done this for the last 10 years in a row. You're doing this because I am here. Is that okay? Chris.